Let's look at uh, pricing an option using Monte Carlo methods. Monte Carlo methods are just any method that uses random numbers in the process. Specifically, uh, the, the method that we're going to be looking at today is called uh, discounted expected value or discounted mean value. And we'll have to get then the average value or the mean value of the stock. Now we know, so it says right here, we know we don't price an option by using its discounted payoff at the expected value of the stock because the expected value of the stock has the drift in it. If the drift is higher, the stock is, tends to go up. The probability of the stock going up is higher. If the drift is higher, then the probability of going the stock going up at any particular time step is higher. And we know that the drift is not a factor in pricing the um, in pricing an option. So we can't just use the expected value of the stock price, then figure out its payoff at that expected value, then discount it back to now for time value of money. Because of course the payoff happens at expiry. We get that payoff later. What we did do though, when we were building those binomial trees was we priced an option by using the discounted expected payoff, which sounds like the thing I just said not to do, but we didn't use the probabilities, the real probabilities. We used, we used these risk normal probabilities. So we hedged away the drift, we hedged away the risk, and the drift canceled out, I guess is a better way to say it. And so we use these risk normal probabilities that had the risk uh, free rate of return. These aren't the real probabilities that the stock goes up or goes down. These are the risk neutral probabilities. And if we're pricing things with risk neutral probabilities, then we can use the expected value because risk neutral probabilities means that we don't expect to get rewarded for taking on extra risk. So we can price with expected value. Anyway, this is the, these are the formulas that we were using when we were doing the binomial tree. We had our risk neutral uh, probability of the stock going up and our V plus then was the value of the stock. So at any particular time point, remember, the stock can go up or the stock can go down. If the stock goes up, then the value of, of our option V plus is the value of the option at that particular uh, up stock price. And likewise, V minus is the value of that particular option at the down stock price, V minus. So we would take a weighted average, P prime, the risk neutral probability is the weight, a weighted average of what the option would be worth if the stock went up or what the option would be worth if the stock went down. A weighted average, but a discounted weighted average. This is our discount factor, our one over one plus R times DT. That's uh, discounting for time value of money. We get these payoffs if the stock goes up, if the stock goes down, we get that um, we have to wait a time step. So this scales it. Here's our discounted expected value. That's what we were doing with the binomial tree. Now, oh, and what are these U's and D's? That's the factor that we multiplied the stock by if the stock happened to go up. It was one plus X, if you remember, or one minus X. So that assumes that the stock is going to be moving uh, in a log normal fashion, that our returns will be um, normally distributed. So let's redo some of those calculations, but now we're not thinking about, um, we're not thinking about options right now, let's just think about the stock. So we're gonna call P then, the not P prime, this is the actual probability. P is the probability that the stock goes up during a short time span DT. So we're going to assume that our time span is small enough so that this, there's only two things the stock could do. It could go up with probability P or it could go down with probability one minus P. We have the uh, stock's annual drift, mu. We have the stock's annual volatility, sigma. We're assuming then, still assuming log normal returns. So if the stock goes up, then S plus, the value of the stock is if it goes up will be s times one plus x likewise down is s times one minus x so our returns 
there's only going to be two returns, an x and a minus x. Our return would be uh, what it is if it goes up minus what it, I bought it for, s, all divided by s. So that's why I get a return of x if the stock goes up and a return of minus x if the stock goes down over that short short time span dt. So what's our expected return? Well, p is the probability that the stock goes up. x is the return I get if the stock goes up. 1 minus p is the probability if the stock goes down and minus x is the probability or sorry is the return if the stock drops down. So this is my expected return. We're setting that equal to well drift is our sort of drift upwards our return upwards but I need to scale that by dt. So mu times dt is our is the expected value of the return over that really short time span. So that gives me one equation with two unknowns. The p right now is an unknown and the x is an unknown. The mu, I get that from the um, from the data, our annualized uh, average return. And dt, we pick that to be a short time span. So now let's look at the variance of the returns. If the volatility is sigma, I get that from the data, that's the annualized standard deviation of the returns, then the variance should be sigma squared and we know that the variance of something is the expected value of its squared, uh, well, the variance is going to be expected value squared minus expected value squared. The variance I can scale with the dt, I need to scale with the dt. Sigma scales with root dt, so sigma squared scales with dt. So there's the uh, variance of my returns. It should be equal to the expected value of x squared, so we need to calculate that. Um, what p is the probability that the stock goes up, in which case um, the x squared would be x squared. 1 minus p is the probability it goes down, in which case the um, value of x squared would be minus x squared, or just x squared. When I simplify this, I get that the expected value of x squared is x squared. So I have the variance set equal to the expected value of x squared, which is going to be x squared, minus the expected value of x squared. So here's an equation where there's also, um, well, in this case, there's one unknown, the x. So I've taken this equation, the expected return, and solved it for x. So here's x as a function of the probability. That's me solving this equation for x. Now I can sub this x into my expected value, or my variance equation. And now I've got one equation where the only unknown right now is the p. The dt I choose to be a small t uh, time step. The sigma I get from the data. The mu I get for the data. And all I need to do is solve this for, solve this for p. When I do solve this for p, I get, so you can verify the calculations, but when I solve this for p, I get p is equal to one half, oh wait, I get a full dt here and a root dt. I can cancel, this is like dt, root dt squared, so I can simplify this. And now there's the probability that the stock goes up, the true probability that the stock goes up, as a function of the time step, the drift rate, and the volatility. Also, now that I know what p is, I can put that p back into here and solve for what the x is, and I, I get the x is equal to sigma root dt. So now this looks familiar. If I go back up to the stuff we were using to make the tree, 
the x value is exactly the same. 1 plus x, 1 minus x. That's a fact, that's a function of the fact that we've assumed that the stock is moving in a log normal fashion. But let's look at the difference between p and p prime. The only difference is p prime, the risk neutral uh, probability, has an r, where the p, the actual probability, has a mu. That's the only difference. So it looks like, remember back up here I said we can't price options by just taking the expected value of the stock and then figuring out what its the value of the option would be at the expected value. We have to use the risk normal expected value. Well, what's the difference? The only difference is I replace the mu, which is how the stock is really tending to go up, with an R. So the only difference between the risk neutral probability, the one that we can use, and the actual probability, the one that we can't use, is instead of mu, the actual drift rate of the stock, you use R, the risk-free rate of return. So our conclusion then is that this binomial tree method that we used is basically just the discounted expected value, but instead of using the mu, we use the R in the probability that the stock goes up or a short time DT. That's it. So how does this help us? Well, let's grab a spreadsheet here. So here's a spreadsheet where I'm going to price a, let's price a put option. Let's price a put option with exercise price equal to 10. And we'll say the stock is currently at $10 now. Now, I'm going to make my DT, I'm going to look over a five, five day period. So the, this put option expires in five days. I'm going to make my DT half a day. That's not exactly small, but for our purposes, just to show us how things are done, that'll be, that'll be okay for now. So then our DT is half a day. I've taken 0.5 half a day divided by 252 trading days. That's my DT in years. Remember that we're measuring time in years. So there's my DT. The stock is currently at $10. Well, what can happen? in the next half day. It can either go up or it can go down. What's the probability that it goes up? Oh, I'm gonna be pricing it. I wanna use this to price, so I don't wanna use this probability to price it. I wanna use this risk normal probability to price it. So the probability that goes up, the risk neutral probability, one half plus our root DT, the DT we've already said is half a day, scale to a year and the sigma um, we say this is 0.4 for our particular stock so then I can calculate what this probability is it's the one-half plus the risk-free rate of return times the squ uh, yeah scaled square root of DT the so the DT would be uh, day so there's our probability that the stock goes up. So now if the stock goes up, how much does it go up to? Well, one plus X, and what was X? It goes up one plus X times the 10 that it was. What is X? X in both cases was sigma root DT. So here's how I'm calculating this then. I made an if I made an if then statement. I'm essentially flipping a coin and if it's less than this probability of uh, 0.5005, I make the stock go up. So if this random number, this flip coin, this uh, random number between 0 and 1 is less than the 0 0.050, I should probably make this P. I'm going to make this P prime to make sure that we all know it's risk neutral probability. So if it's less than, then I take the 
B6 value, the stock price before, and multiply it by 1 plus x, or I multiply it by 1 minus x. So every time I reload this page, it's like flipping a coin. There it went down, so it must be using this 1 minus. If I reload the page, it, there it went up. It went down for a lot, but okay. Anyway, it's a random thing. So that's what the stock could be. There's only two choices in this on this first simulation it starts at 10 it either goes up to 10 16 or if it goes down it goes down to nine dollars and 82 cents so now the stock what happens in the the next half a day i'm just going to copy that cell looks like it went down and then it went back up notice where i have the dollar signs here is like locking in the e2 so it's always referring to this probability. So now my time step is a day. If I flip this all the way to here, there's there's one possible stock um, future. It went down, it went down, it went up, it went down, it went up, it went up, down, up, up, up. And now I can, you know, it, this is what the stock is five days later, a simulation, one possible simulation out of many. Um, how much is this put worth if the stock is worth $10.34 at expiry? Well, it's equal to nothing because it's finishing out of the money, but our formula would be equals the max of zero or $10 minus the stock price. Yeah, zero. So this is one simulation of the stock. If I were to graph that. There's one simulation of the stock and it finished out of the money. It's a put, so in order for this uh, to have any value, in order for the put to have any value, the stock has to finish at less than $10. If I were to reload the page, can I get another? These are all possible things that could happen, possible futures. I guess I'm flipping this coin, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm flipping this coin 10 times, so there's like two to the 10 possible outcomes that could happen here. Is that true? Yeah. All right. But that's only one simulation. If I were to look at 10 different possible futures, no, 20. So here I've got 20 different possible futures. So if I were to graph these, I'm going to see 10 of those possible stock futures. Those are all the things that could happen. They're all sort of bouncing around 10. Here's 20 possible futures. In the first possible future, the put would be worth um, $0.015. So if I copy this all the way down here, these are all the possible. Here's where the, the stock finishes out of the money. It's above 10. Here's where the stock finishes in the money. So. Out of these 20, if I take the average of those, then the average value or the expected value or the mean value of that put five days later is about 15 cents. So you would expect this thing to be worth 15 cents. Now remember, we move the stock forward with this risk neutral rate of return. So we can, we can price that expected value. But of course, if it's worth 15 cents five days in the future, what's it worth now? Well, I need to take this value and divide it by one plus the risk-free rate of return times the DT. Oh, 
this value changed now. This is now seven cents. Why? Nah, because I clicked return and it regenerated some random numbers in here and got a different value. Now it's saying it's worth seven cents and it's discounted. Is um, it's only five days, so the discount is not that severe. But this is our answer. And what's our problem here? Every time I reload this page, I'm getting a different answer. Yeah, because I'm picking different random numbers. So the issue with this is I've only done 20 simulations because that what fits on a spreadsheet on the screen. To get a good answer, you'd have to do like a thousand of these simulations and then take the average and then, you know, law of large numbers, it would eventually approach the the true value, the value that we would get if, not if we use the tree, but if we use the formulas that we're going to learn coming up in chapter 8. So if we can, if we can use the store-bought formulas, the ready formulas, the page 200 formulas at the end of chapter, at the in, in the book, what's the point of all this Monte Carlo simulation? Well, we could put any sort of payoff in here. It doesn't have to be one of the sort of standard, you know, puts and calls and binary puts and binary calls. It could be anything weird, like a parabola or something like that, that we don't have standard formulas for. And this, we, we wouldn't have to change anything in our spreadsheet except for how we evaluated the option at this particular stock price. That's the advantage of pricing at uh, using this discounted expected value. The disadvantage is that you really have to do like a thousand simulations to get any sort of an accuracy. If we had enough, a thousand let's say, then every time I reloaded this page, the number would change, but it would only change in like the fifth decimal place, the eighth decimal place. So the it, it, you would be confident on the actual value that it was giving you. Here I'm not confident because it changes each time. So now you should be able to price any payoff value using discounted expected values. Again, expected using the risk neutral probability and the risk neutral probability is the probability where the drift rate is replaced with the risk neutral rate of return. 